today, folks. It's DIY Guy123 here, bringing you another do it yourself video. Today is a little different. I normally show people how to fix problems. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about whether it's a good idea or not to invest big money in scan tools, uh, tools in general, but scan tools specifically. And I'll cut to the chase, it is, and I'm going to explain to you why I feel that it is worth it to be sensible, but sometimes you do have to open your wallet and buy a high quality tool. This is the Xtool D7 bi-directional OBD2 scanner. I recently acquired it. It was six or 700 bucks on Amazon. I can't remember the exact price and purchased it. A friend of mine thought it would be, he did some research, recommended that I did a quick check. Yep, looks good. And you know, there are various grades of scan tools. There's the, there are the cheap handheld small ones that are, you know, one to $200 that you can get at any uh, like auto repair place that sells parts, they sell these scan tools. They've been around for 20 years and I suppose they've improved over time, but they're good for checking engine codes. Um, the latest one I had purchased three or four years ago for a couple hundred bucks, it did ABS codes. I think it might have done um, ABS engine, didn't do transmission, didn't do body control module, did a whole, there was a lot that it was missing. So anyway, this time around, I elected to go with what I consider like a medium to high end. There are much more expensive ones than this. You know, you can spend any amount, two, three grand and up if you wanted factory scan tools from Toyota or if you wanted like a super duper snap on one. I don't, I can't comment on those. But so one of the things that makes scan tools more expensive than others is the ability to do bi-directional scanning. So bi-directional means that they can read codes, but they can also set uh, functions in the computer. So for example, if you're troubleshooting a power door lock problem and you know, power door lock, you press the button and nothing happens. If your vehicle has that signal running through the computer, you can hook up a bi-directional scan tool and tell the computer to lock the doors. And if you tell the computer to lock the doors and through the scan tool and the doors do lock, then you know it's not a lock mechanism problem. It's not the wiring to the computer, it's not the computer, it's probably the switch or wiring from the switch to the computer. That's just a quick example about how bi-directional scan tools can help you fix things quicker. They help you diagnose things much quicker. Generally, it'll cut down but the troubleshooting time by half or maybe like by 10 times, depending on what the issue is. Here's what happened to me recently, which has motivated me to make this video, is a family member came to me and said, I found this Hyundai uh, Santa Fe. It's in excellent condition. It uh, rides great, it sounds great, it wasn't smoked in, everything's great, great. It only has 60,000 miles or less than 100,000 kilometers on it. And they told me the price and it seemed like a very fair price to me. And I said, well, if it's what you say, it's probably great. They asked me to take a look at it. I brought it over, put it up in the hoist. I was really looking for corrosion and leaks. That's really all I was looking for. It had even had a recent safety inspect four or five months ago. Car was in great shape. Underneath, no, no significant corrosion with the exception of the cross member, the rear cross member, which is typical for that age in this climate where we have salt on the roads in the winter. No leaks. Interior of the car looked really good. The paint looked excellent. Like, I mean, really good for, for was it like a 10, 12 year old car, 10 year old car. All looked good. And then I thought, yeah, I'm gonna just check to see if there's a check engine light. There was, and uh, I grabbed my new scanner and put it on. Now my old scanner would have told me that there was an, e an EVAP code. And EVAP, evaporative emissions codes, relate to in the fuel system. If you have a leak in the fuel system or some of the purge valves or somewhere in there, um, the computer will detect that. Generally, if it's a leak in the pressurized part of the system, you know because it smells like fuel whenever the vehicle's running. It'll drip fuel on the ground. It's, uh, you'll get horrible gas mileage. And um, it, it generally would set other codes off if the fuel pressures you know, can't be maintained at the fuel injectors. The, that's sort of less common. The more common cause is if the, you didn't put the gas cap on tight enough or there's dirt or corrosion or whatever along the rim where the gas cap screws in. Or what I've had a couple of times is and there's a return line that comes back to the tank and it will it will be corroded badly enough that it's got a hole in it. And so I would have said, well, nah, for this price, you know, I don't see any fuel leaks, don't smell any fuel. It's probably one of these lines that air goes through. I would kind of ignore it given the price of the vehicle and the age of the vehicle. And so I kind of moved on. But then what this code, to code reader told me that my other one wouldn't is it had ABS problems 
And I'm just going to show you those codes. And by the way, I was, I was a little disappointed because I hadn't, I hadn't, um, I didn't have a camera with me when I was doing this inspection. And I thought, oh shoot, you know, I can't show people after the fact, I can't show them the problems that this found. And then I remembered that the D7 automatically creates a report every vehicle you scan. And I checked back in the history and there it is. So even though the vehicle is long gone, I can still share this with you. So yeah, EVAP code P0455, P0447, um, vent control circuit open. I mean, that, that's significant. And then large leak, uh, I think those two errors go hand in hand. But again, I wasn't so concerned about those. But then when I get into the ABS trouble codes that this one would read in my, I don't think my other, I don't know. My other one might have read some of these. I don't know. Uh, lost communication with steering angle sensor, variant coding error, four-wheel drive CAN signal or communication error. Anytime you have a communication error, it's generally a wiring problem or there's an actual problem with one of the modules involved in the communication. Generally not good um, and, you know, can be expect expensive to fix. Next, there were airbag problems, battery voltage low uh, for, for um, yeah, B1102, two error, two error codes there. And then we get into the four wheel drive control. EMC, open or short to battery. Don't really know what that is, but I know that, oh, I know what open and short to battery is, but with respect to a P1728 in this vehicle, it's not good. Could be very expensive to fix that. I highly doubt the four wheel drive is functional with that error going on. Um, and you know, if you scroll back up, we have this four wheel drive can signal and then a four wheel drive control module trouble code as well as ABS modules and airbag modules. Like, that's a lot of stuff wrong with this vehicle. So I explained to the person that was thinking of buying it, I said, if you just drove it on days like today and you know, it drives great, you might be super happy with it. But in the winter time where you want ABS to work and when you want the four wheel drive to work, those modules may not work. Like you may not get four wheel drive to engage and ABS might not work. So I said, it could be hundreds or thousands of dollars to resolve that. Like if modules need to be changed, it's not unreasonable to have 500 to a thousand dollars to replace a module. So I said, look, you could have minimal work or it could be like $3,000 in parts and labor and stuff that maybe I don't know how to help them with. So I got thinking about it. Even if you took the best case scenario and said it only needs like $1,500 worth of parts to resolve those problems, which will be really significant in the winter, that's twice what this scanner cost. So that extra knowledge that I provided them with, they decided not to buy the car and were grateful to know the extra stuff that was wrong with it. And because I had this scanner that cost, let's say $700, it saved almost twice that in repair costs. Um, so, you know, this is just one example that I hope to have many examples that it's worth it to invest in your tools. And if you're looking for a business case on, on you know, instead of buying like the one $200 scan tool to jump up to the, 500 to a thousand dollar range. Um, if you only have a single issue that you're chasing, you know, your vehicle's only doing one thing or one thing wrong, or it's got what door locks on, on something that's not right. Um, sure. The cheaper scan tool will be great as long as it can control or help you diagnose the specific thing you're chasing. But if you have multiple vehicles that have problems or one vehicle has many problems, it's definitely, I feel worth it to invest in the, more expensive scan tools. I'm hoping to make several videos showing how to use the tool. If you like my videos, please subscribe. You're gonna see more uh, videos on that tool and how to use it coming up.